Uh, hello, this is a real pleasure to uh, be here today to welcome you uh, for the new session of the IHCH Journal Clubs. Uh, today, we welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Fazia Yassin and Dr. Shalin Kotari from uh, Yale uh, Smilo Cancer Centers uh, that are going to discuss a very uh, interesting and complex uh, case-based discussion of high-risk mental cell lymphoma. So uh, now the floor uh, is you, uh, Faiza. Uh, please uh, present this uh, very uh, beautiful case. Great, thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm a first year fellow at Yale, and this is a case that Dr. Kothari and I saw in clinic together. Uh, very briefly, we have a few learning objectives. We'll pause throughout the case to spend some time on each of these uh, using a, a case-based question approach. So I will start here, uh, starting with the case. This is a 72-year-old woman with a past medical history of right-sided ductal carcinoma in situ, for which she had a lumpectomy, radiation therapy, and endocrine therapy. She has endometrial cancer, for which she has received six cycles of carbotaxol-based chemotherapy, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, who initially presented to us with fatigue, a 30-pound weight loss, nausea, and abdominal pain. At initial presentation, we felt her ECOG performance status was a two. And just as a brief note, we have changed a few of the the ages and dates for patient privacy. On her initial workup, this is in the emergency room, her labs were notable for a macrocytic anemia with a hemoglobin of 9.6. She had a leukocytosis with a white blood cell count of 14.2 and a platelet count of 100, the mild thrombocytopenia. Her LDH was 532, just about double the upper limit of normal. And she had an initial CT chest, abdomen, pelvis that showed an enlarged spleen measuring 16.2 centimeters with what's described as mild periportal lymphadenopathy. And I'm gonna move into her initial PET CT, which you should see as a video on the left. It showed intense uptake in her spleen and then moderately avid FDG uptake in lymph nodes both above and below the diaphragm and some indeterminate breast calcifications. We then proceeded with a bone marrow biopsy that was consistent with mental cell lymphoma involving 30% of her marrow cellularity. It's described as groups and small sheets of medium to large atypical lymphoid cells. Her immunohistochemistry showed uh, aberrant CD5 expression with cyclin D1 positivity. And they did comment on high KI67 on the bone marrow, but didn't provide a percent. Her cytogenetics, so a translocation of 1114, material of indeterminate origin on chromosomes 3, 12, 15, and 16, loss of chromosome 13 and 18, and gain of chromosome 22. And her fish was consistent. It showed a CCND1 IGH rearrangement. Her peripheral blood, blood flow cytometry showed involvement of disease in the peripheral blood as well, um, FMC7 positive, and again, CD5 positive. We did get TP53 mutation testing on the peripheral blood, which was negative, and this was looking uh, at exons four through nine. So I'll pause here with our two initial questions. One, do we have all the information we need to calculate risk for this patient? And in general, how do you risk stratify a patient with mental cell lymphoma? So thank you, Faiza. So please, uh, Shalin, the could you please give me so, some answer to that important question? Yeah, so um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, I think we have pretty much all the information we need uh, to prognosticate uh, and risk stratify this patient, particularly because as of today in the clinic, we use uh, either a MIPI score, which is mental cell lymphoma prognostic index or a variation of it called MIPI-C or MIPI-S-MIPI. So if you look here, it's basically a combination of age, ECOG performance status, LDH, and white blood cell count. And some of these will include KI67 percentage, uh, like MIPI-C and um, MIPI-B. Now, um, of course, this is a very simple uh, uh, criteria, but I think it's still very helpful. It, of course, doesn't look into the genetics of the disease, which is becoming more and more important. And we'll uh, touch upon that in just a bit. Next slide. So here you can see the other high-risk features. So uh, 
blastoid histology itself being a poor prognostic factor. You can look at the high MIPI score that we looked at in previous slide with median OS of around 30 months. KS67 expression is still very important, and the threshold that we use in the clinic is 30%. It's very important to understand that KS67 expression can only be looked at in a lymph node. So for example, or wherever we can look at the architecture without any interruption. So for example, a bone marrow biopsy is probably not the best area to look at KS67 because there are other other uh, cells and other uh, morphology, which is normally present in the bone marrow, which makes the percentage very difficult to interpret. Um, uh, but in, in our case, there was, yeah, K67 was high enough in the bone marrow that the pathologist uh, made a note of it. Um, TP53 alterations, which includes deletions um, and also uh, mutations, uh, are a big prognostic factor. And you can look at the overall survival being only uh, up to two years. Complex karyotype is a big one as well. Um, and then the rest are more genetic markers that as of today, we do not use in the clinic. Uh, but this is something definitely to be aware of. Um, because eventually, if you look at the other aggressive lymphomas like DLBCL, we are slowly making progress in adding genetic data uh, upfront to understand. Uh, right now, it's more prognostic, but eventually, we're hoping that it will become predictive to certain kinds of therapy as well. Next slide. So, we are just highlighting here uh, the three high risk features that this particular patient has. So here she has high MAP score, uh, KI67 is high, um, and uh, she also has a complex karyotype. So here uh, I, uh, to kind of zoom into two more commonly done uh, genetic tests um, and much cheaper than looking at, uh, you know, particular NGS panel. Um, uh, here you can see on the top TP53 deletion and the impact of it. So you see how, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the overall survival, you definitely see a drop in patients who have TP53 deletion uh, in the upfront setting. And, but the, that difference is much more uh, impactful in TP53 mutated disease. So that's why we, it's our routine practice in the clinic to get somatic mutation analysis done just for TP53. Um, uh, most of the times we have, we can only get this testing done if the patient has leukemic involvement. So it's easier to just send blood uh, for somatic mutation analysis. If they don't have leukemic involvement, then uh, there are certain companies that will do uh, somatic mutation analysis in fixed tissue as well, but that, uh, that typically we don't perform. Uh, on the right, you will see uh, the impact of complex karyotype. So DN being de novo. So I would just focus your attention on the top two curves, uh, the, the solid blue being non-complex karyotype, which is the bulk of patients in this particular analysis, which is 224 patients. Um, and the one in the dotted red is a complex karyotype uh, de novo uh, and 80 patients of those. So you see that is again, a quite a bit of difference uh, uh, in patients who have complex karyotype. And complex karyotype is really defined um, as more than three uh, karyotypic abnormality other than translocation 1114, which is, uh, which is a classic translocation seen in mantle cell lymphoma in most cases. Next slide. So, uh, yeah, you can start. <laughs> Um, this brings us back to our patient, just based on the data that Dr. Kothari presented, we know that she's at high risk. She has a complex karyotype. She has a high MIPI score. Her KI-67 is high. And then she also has stage four disease with involvement in the bone marrow and lymph node involvement above and below the diaphragm. Um, so we'll pause for three additional questions here. How do we think about treatment options for this patient? Is high risk disease predictive of response to certain therapies? And then what is the current literature for consolidative autologous stem cell transplantation and maintenance rituximab? Thank you, Faiza. So can you have also your insight on, on that question, please, Shalina? Yeah. So the frontline treatment options in Mendel cell lymphoma, and I talked to fellows quite a bit in the clinic that it's a zoo. <laughs> we really have made a lot of progress, but then we have kind of taken a few steps back as well, because we, as a group, as a field, we really 
cannot uh, agree upon one particular regimen or two particular regimens, for example, which are uh, so quote unquote winners. So when we look at different trials, there are different combinations that are studied. But I think this particular uh, paper uh, by uh, uh, Timothy Fensky, it really puts uh, these regimens as intensive and non-intensive, which I think is the appropriate way to think about these regimens. Uh, intensive regimens are typically used in patients who are younger, who have better performance status, uh, definitely would not be our patient. Um, I'm not sure if I would count BR, uh, RRC as an intensive regimen, but we can get, get into that in just a bit. Uh, but these are all, uh, you know, most of these are cytarabine containing regimens and uh, cytarabine is at quite high doses. Um, so, for example, if you look at Nordic MCL2, that is a cytarabine containing regimen. RCHOP RD HAP is also a cytarabine containing regimen. And those are, I would say, most commonly used um, and has the most data, as you can see here, with most number of patients. Uh, but the one uh, regimen that is becoming more and more favorable in the sort of quote unquote like modern era of mantle cell lymphoma is bendamustine rituximab. Um, and it can be made a bit intensive by adding cytarabine to that regimen, which uh, again, it remains to be uh, parsed out whether in the bendamustine era is cytarabine still important. And I don't think we have answer to that. Um, um, uh, Reed Merriman at Dina Farber and their and his group, they have uh, performed a couple of trials, early phase clinical trials, uh, you know, alternating BR and IR era C, or uh, doing upfront three cycles of BR followed by three cycles of R era C, um, uh, and they have found favorable uh, response rates. So that's pretty much my favorite, where it kind of is at the cusp of being intensive and non-intensive. And usually it, it uh, all patients would uh, be able to get this therapy, even if their performance status is slightly lower. Non-intensive regimens include our CHOP, uh, BR. But one thing I can say for sure, it, we have enough data to suggest that if you are going non-intensive route, then we should definitely use BR or RCHOP. RCHOP is basically an inferior regimen in mantle cell lymphoma. Um, and then there are other regimens like lenalidomide with rituximab, uh, uh, RCHOP with bortezomib, which is also known as VR-CAP, um, which is here. Um, and there is another regimen which I find very interesting and I use occasionally is RBAC 500, which is similar to BRR RSC, but the RSC doses here are very low and they are incorporated into each cycle of bendamustine rituximab rather than using it separately as a separate cycle. Uh, next slide. So this I thought was a very interesting paper from Peter Martin at Cornell and, and his group where he, he, they look at uh, from 2011 to, to 2020 and they see um, all the patterns that have changed in mantle cell lymphoma. And you can see that in even in age six, less than 65 and of course in more age more than 65, you see this increased uptake uh, for of physicians using BR-based therapies. Um, and re a reduction in the use of cytarabine containing regimens um, um, and our CHOP mainly. Um, and that holds true, of course, in more than 65 e uh, years as well. There's just more data for that, and I would totally support that. Um, and here, the same paper looks at real world time to next treatment data. Um, which clearly shows that our CHOP is an inferior regimen when it comes to requiring next line of therapy, um, which usually happens much earlier with our CHOP based therapy um, rather than uh, with uh, either BR or cytarabine containing regimens, which could include our CHOP, but our CHOP by itself is what I'm talking about when we talk about the red curve here. Um, so, um, you know, we can look at the next slide here. And these two curves are basically looking at the data, which I think is most impactful as of today. There are many other randomized prospective data on it, but this is the, again, the same paper um, looking at almost 600, 700 patients um, and looking at the impact of autologous stem cell transplant. And uh, on the right, you're looking at uh, the impact of maintenance rituximab. So on the left, we can see that 
patients who received or did not receive autologous stem cell transplant, there was hardly any difference in overall survival. There is definitely a difference in time to next treatment, but uh, that doesn't uh, amount to improvement in overall survival. So really the question, and, and this is looking at younger patients, so that's important to note here. Um, so the question whether you need autologous stem cell transplant in this modern era with bendamustine-based therapy is a bit uh, unanswered. And I would favor on the side of avoiding, my threshold to do transplant has gone much higher than it was before in this modern era because of all this data. And uh, authors concluded in this paper saying that the, the, now I think we have enough data to suggest that newer clinical trials can avoid or at least answer that question of avoiding autologous stem cell transplant. And I think that is appropriate. Um, on the right, uh, if you could go back on, sorry. Um, on the right, you have a data for maintenance rituximab and uh, the curves on the top are uh, basically regimens that included maintenance rituximab and on the, on the bottom are the regimens that did not include maintenance rituximab and you clearly see a overall survival advantage. So um, I think this goes to show that although retrospectively that uh, bendamustin rituximab, even in this modern era, this remains a different kind of lymphoma than other aggressive lymphomas where maintenance of rituximab is still pretty important. Next slide. So, uh, you know, kind of getting to your question, uh, Faiza, whether this particular patient, can we do something differently, right? This patient is a high-risk patient um, or, and definitely has uh, features that are otherwise going to be unfavorable for her, even if we use the therapies that we talked about. Uh, so there has been a lot of new data coming out, one being in younger patients, uh, where you add BTKI to a regimen uh, of, of, uh, of interest. So for example, this particular trial is actually, we only have an abstract, it's, a, it's in a plenary session of the upcoming ASH 2020 in December. So I'm really looking forward to looking at the data uh, in detail especially looking at how many patients were categorized as high risk and how did they do in comparison to the entire population that we don't have the data yet. But it basically shows that um, autologous transplant transplant is not that important if you are adding frontline BTK inhibitor to an RCHOP RD HAP containing regimen. Um, and the so to say a winner out of all three is the regimen ibrutinib, RCHOP, RDHEP, followed by ibrutinib maintenance and avoiding transplant altogether. Next slide. And the same similar data of adding BTIKI in frontline, but in, this time in older patients was published in NEJM earlier this year as part of the SHINE trial. Um, um, with first author being Michael Wong at uh, MD Anderson. And they basically looked at uh, uh, adding ibrutinib to bendamustine rituximab backbone. And on the left, you can see the PFS curves. And on the right, you can see overall survival curves. Um, what I find uh, overall, there is a lot of debate, a lot of uh, you know healthy debate going on in the field regarding the data for this trial. But I would say that I would personally not favor using this regimen per se in elderly patients because of what we see in their table three of the manuscript where the causes of death in the ibrutinib group was significantly higher than in the placebo group. And we did not see potentially because of this toxicity data, we did not see uh, oral survival advantage. So I would rather use BR and then use ibrutinib as next line and you know sequence these therapies rather than combining everything up front. Next slide. So based on, again, the data that we have and the things that Dr. Kothari reviewed, um, I'm gonna loop back to our patient. We decided that she wasn't a good transplant candidate initially with her ECOG performance status, and then also felt that she wasn't a great candidate for RCHAP due to some cardiac comorbidities and then her prior chemotherapy exposure. So we decided to go ahead with a rituximab bendamustine for three cycles, do an interim PET-CT, and then do an additional three cycles with rituximab cytarabine, and then reassess at that point. So this is her initial treatment timeline. She did get about a one-week course of prednisone prior to seeing us as a temporizing measure. 
and then she received cycle one of arbendamustine. Unfortunately, she had several cardiac complications with this. She was admitted to the hospital about a week later with new onset atrial fibrillation, new non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EF of 35%. She did have a normal cardiac cath at that time, um, and she was medically managed, did well, but then was readmitted five days later with an aphasic event thought to be a TIA. She did have a lumbar puncture that showed negative cytology. Her symptoms resolved and she was able to get arbendamustine cycle two on schedule. Again, after cycle two, 10 days later, she again had rapid atrial fibrillation for which she was hospitalized. And ultimately the cardiac oncology team thought that this was related more to a tachyarrhythmia. So she had AV node ablation, had a pacemaker and ICD placed because her EF had dropped to 29%. And they felt um, that perhaps this could have been two tandem processes and was unlikely to be arbendamustine related. So they approved an additional cycle, uh, arbendamustine cycle three, day one, which she did not have any further complications with. And we have a treatment response, PET-CT, with near complete response. This is about two and a half months from her treatment initiation um, with a Duval score of two. And I'll keep going in her treatment here. We um, inquired uh, with cardiac oncology whether she could be cleared for cytarabine. And while we were waiting, we decided to go ahead and do an additional cycle of arbendamustine. So she received a fourth cycle. She was approved to go ahead and do cytarabine-based treatment. So she received cycle one and cycle two in the hospital without any complications. And then we obtained an end of treatment PET-CT, um, which should be rotating here, perfect, uh, which unfortunately showed extensive innumerable hypermetabolic nodules sort of diffusely throughout her body, most prominently on her breast tissue, notably on the right and in the right axilla. Um, on exam, one of the breast nodules was palpable, and we actually were concerned that this could have been a recurrence of her primary breast cancer, but after we obtained a core biopsy of that breast mass, it did show refractory mantle cell lymphoma with a high KI67 of 70%, and I've just included a few of the slides from our pathology colleagues to support this diagnosis, which leads us into our next set of questions, which is, at this point, she has a refractory disease. This uh, happened five and a half months after initial treatment initiation. So what are the treatment options for relapsed refractory disease? And at this point, is she a CAR-T candidate? And how should we bridge her safely to CAR-T therapy? So uh, thank you, Faiza. Just for people that are listening to us, uh, a reminder, you can send some question in the chat. We'll have some more time at the end of the presentation to take your question and answer them. So do not hesitate to post your question now and uh, we'll have time at the end. So now I can give it back to uh, Shalin if you can give you uh, your feedback on these questions. Yeah. So, you know, the treatment for a relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma is fairly, um, uh, is a very, very exciting field, I feel, or, or just since I have graduated, we have seen multiple changes in the algorithms, and um, I think we have made tremendous progress. So, um, you know, I, I, I kind of tell my fellows uh, that, you know, mental cell lymphoma has a lot of unknowns, uh, much more than knowns, uh, but I think we are changing that. And thanks to like some really strong groups that uh, in, in US and elsewhere work on uh, really enrolling these patients and finding uh, appropriate drugs that we can use. And the poster child for that is BTK inhibitors, as you can see here. These are all the drugs that were tested um, in mantle cell lymphoma in a clinical trial at various phases. Um, but I think the clear winner as a, as a class effect is ibrutinib um, and uh, the other covalent BTK inhibitors um, uh, with like uh, duration of responses being, uh, you know, quite high. Um, the other class of drug which has been found to be equally effective, although probably more uh, better better used in combination with BTK inhibitors than a single agent is venetoclax. And there have been trials, uh, small uh, clinical trials, looking at the combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax in mantle cell lymphoma. It's a bit early to make any particular uh, judgment calls on those trials yet. 
Um, the other new kid on the block, I would say, is non-covalent BTK inhibitor um, uh, uh, called pertobrutinib. Um, one of the mechanisms of resistance to ibrutinib, akal ibrutinib and xanabrutinib, is a point mutation on the BTK gene, which uh, uh, makes this uh, binding of ibrutinib and akal ibrutinib on, on the BTK uh, uh, ineffective. Um, and that can be circumvented by using a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. Um, and we have seen early responses in patients who have relapsed after covalent BTK inhibition, um, but the data is a bit too premature to make any meaningful conclusions, especially in mantle cell lymphoma. There is definitely much more stronger data for pertobrutinib in BTK uh, on in non it's sorry in covalent BTK uh, inhibitor patients in CLL, but whether that translates into mantle cell or not, that remains to be seen. Um, next slide. So overall, uh, this is a slide kind of I took out from my education piece to the fellows where, uh, you know, this is how I think about it in relapse refractory setting in patients who have, uh, who have started kind of progressing on BTK inhibitors. Number one thing I do is not peel off the BTK inhibitor yet. If you peel off BTK inhibitors, there are many clones that are still responding and the disease can blossom very quickly and it can become a big challenge to, to manage, the, uh, manage the disease, especially because at this stage, usually all mental cell lymphomas are chemodifractory. So, um, you know, it becomes a big problem. So I always keep the BTK inhibitor going um, as until the next line of therapy has started taking effect. Um, so for example, uh, we, you know, look at frail elderly or other patients, uh, I would continue BTK inhibitor while providing supportive care, but then add venetoclax and layer it on top of BTK inhibitor um, or eventually swap it out with lenalidomide with rituximab. Uh, in younger patients, I would definitely consider CAR T-cell therapy, and I will talk about the data in a bit, but there is a lot of exciting data with brexocaptogene cellulosal. Um, and occasionally, although now very rarely, we consider allogenic stem cell transplantation, which would be uh, with curative intent, of course. Um, if the patient is older or less fit, then we typically see how they did with the initial therapy. So, you know, a classic example being somebody who was diagnosed with mental cell lymphoma at age 65, uh, got BR, uh, and then got 10 years out of BR. Then, and then I gave BTK inhibitor and then had a relapse. I would, I may even go back to uh, BR and see whether they have a, a response again. Um, if they are not eligible for CAR T cells or, uh, or other more intensive therapies. Um, and then, of course, at uh, tertiary cancer, cancer centers like us, we would definitely prefer a clinical trial as well in these uh, uh, sets of patients. Next slide. Perfect. So this leads us into what we decided for our patient. Uh, we did discuss with her at this stage CAR T therapy. So she had T cell collection. And as a bridge to CAR T, we made the decision to start a calibrutinib. Um, we obtained a treatment response PET CT after six weeks, which I will loop forward to, that showed marked interval worsening of her disease. Um, so looping back, Back here, we decided to go ahead and add venetoclax. In the interim here, there was a delay in her CAR T manufacturing, which is another reason um, we felt that an addition of venetoclax would be helpful for her. She was admitted for an accelerated ramp up of treatment. Um, and during that admission, we heard that her CAR T cells were manufactured to spec. So at this stage, we got a pre CAR T PET CT, which was also a few weeks after the addition of venetoclax which actually showed a marked improvement with the regression of many of the subcutaneous nodules we were seeing and some of the lymphadenopathy that we were seeing. So she, um, we did have a brief discussion about proceeding with CAR-T or seeing the duration of her response and ultimately decided to proceed with CAR-T therapy. So she was admitted for lymphodepleting conditioning with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide and then five days later, um, uh, had day zero with CAR-T infusion. She um, had a fairly reasonably complex CAR-T hospital course. So she uh, developed neutrophenic fever without a clear source for which she was treated with antibiotics. She did have a grade two CRS for which she received tocilizumab for four doses. 
and then also had an episode of aphasia for which we were suspecting CAR T neurotoxicity. She received steroids for this, but we weren't able to fully work it up because around the same time, she also had uh, an episode of torsades leading to a VFib arrest. She had an ICD in place already from her earlier cardiac complications and she was successfully defibrillated. Um, and despite all of these complications, she actually recovered really well with um, all of the above management and went home three weeks from admission, or excuse me, three weeks from day zero. This is her day 30 PET CT, uh, which looks amazing. Shared for mission, marked continued decrease in activity of the soft tissue nodules, um, scored as a Duval score of two. They did comment on a small hypermetabolic nodule in the uh, lungs, which resolved on her day 100 PET CT. Um, and on exam and further evaluation in clinic, um, she felt clinically very well, ECOG of zero, back to regular activity. Um, and doing doing incredibly well. Yeah, so you know, I think uh, this patient uh, is a great case to talk about the 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 benefits of CAR T and the problems with CAR T, right? So we we had multiple delays. We um, and it goes to show that if you don't have a good bridging regimen in mind we can get into trouble, right? So time in high-risk patients, I would definitely uh, suggest that we are already thinking of using CAR-T the moment they have a relapse after the first-line therapy because the, the window for bridging might be very small. And even if it is not small, you can get run into problems with manufacturing of CAR-T and you may need to do it once or twice and that could take away a couple of months. So, you know, in, in, in her case, uh, even though we added venetoclax, I, you know, in retrospectively, I do think that it was BTK inhibitors that really did all the job. It was just a bit delayed uh, it, in showing radiographic response. Um, but I'm glad that we added venetoclax because we don't want to take a chance, right? So in high-risk patients, um, when you look at the data, the BTK inhibitors usually work, and this is more TP53 mutated data, uh, but it doesn't work for more than a few months. So we, we couldn't have taken any chances, and that's why we added venetoclax. But all said and done, I'm glad that she was able to get brexucaptogen um, and, that, um, and that it worked out well for her in spite of all the complications that she had. So if you look at the brexucaptogen data, and this is a three-year follow-up data, which was published in JCO in the, earlier this year. Um, and if you focus on the purple curve, you'll see that these are curves that we have never seen in mantle cell lymphoma in the relapse refractory setting. Um, you know, there is a potentially a tail developing um, and we are seeing, uh, you know, 50% uh, like median OS uh, more, much more than 46 months. Um, this is, this is great. And patients who respond and who have a CR, uh, which is um, the, the top curve, um, you can see that curves look much better in those patients. But then there are some patients, although a very small fraction, who have no response and they do poorly, um, and the partial responders uh, kind of somewhere in the middle. So at least in the US, it is FDA approved, um, and it has definitely a broader approval than um, uh, you know, the, then the field anticipated, which is, I think, great for patients. It is approved for second line therapy and beyond. So technically you could use this in, you know, in a very high risk patient who has a, um, a quick relapse and you're immediately moving to CAR T. But I would say that for the most part, practically speaking, you would still need to bridge with a BTK inhibitor, even if you have made the decision to move to CAR T, just like we did in this patient. Um, and uh, after about three years of follow-up, ORR with this particular product remains consistently high at 91% uh, with 68% complete response rates. So this, I, this is a supplementary figure in that paper, but I thought it was very interesting where they break down 30-month oral survival data based on various high-risk features. So you can see here TI67, uh, first one being less than 30 and more than 30. Um, and what I would really want to draw your attention to is that the curse, uh, the overall survival uh, rates look very similar, right? So in some ways, 
uh, we think of brexocaptogen in mantle cell lymphoma as an equalizer uh, in the sense that it really doesn't differentiate between high risk features and low risk features. Um, uh, and that holds true patients with you know, prior ibrutinib exposure, prior acal ibrutinib exposure, and TP53 mutation. Although I wouldn't make too much out of it, the reason being that the, there is a lot of patients with missing data and there are only six patients who had mutation detected. So this remains to be seen, whether this is a regimen that would be truly effective in TP53 mutated disease, uh, but that's definitely intriguing data. Um, and if you look at this particular subgroup where um, uh, you know, pa patients who had received either or or both, you again see that similar overall survival rate uh, upwards of 60% uh, at 30 months, which is uh, pretty, uh, you know, uh, uh, good to see. Next slide. So overall, I personally am very excited to be in this field and take care of mantle cell lymphoma patients, especially in this era, because we have already made a lot of progress. Now, I see a couple of questions in the chat, where, you know, comparing and contrasting cards with bispecifics. And I think that's a very important comparison because bispecific antibodies are much easier to give. Um, and they are also in some ways T cell engaging therapies, right? So um, I'm hoping that overall as a field, even in diffuse large B cell lymphomas and mantle cell lymphomas where bispecific antibodies become um, equally good, if not better than CAR T cell therapies, the reason being that they are off the shelf, much easier to give um, because most of the patients are being treated in, out in the community and not at tertiary care centers where you have CAR T cells available. Um, and then I would hope that we, and we have already started seeing clinical trials based on that, but where we have risk adapted therapies developing in frontline setting, where you are particularly targeting complex karyotype and TP53 mutated patients. But of course, this is very difficult to do because these are very small subset of patients and it would require a large effort of you know, having a multi-institutional trial. Um, antibody drug conjugates, uh, the new exciting one being ROR1, ROR1 antibody drug conjugate, which is becoming important in mantle cell lymphoma, non-covalent beta inhibitors that we have talked about, and then just various combinations of the above drugs to see if we can minimize chemo even further and avoid autologous stem cell transplant, and then eventually also up finding out the right sequence for these therapies so that we can give maximum mileage uh, to our patients. So at this point, I think we, should, uh, I'm happy, we, we are happy to take questions. Both of you for this uh, great case presentation on, on this really nice overview of the data regarding the treatment of a mental cell lymphoma, both in the frontline setting and also in refractory patients, and in particular this question of the CAR T cells. And you already give some answer regarding the place of the CAR T cell versus uh, B specific monoclonal antibodies. So. What is your feeling? You really think that in the next few years we will not use CAR T cell anymore and it will be only about B specific antibodies for mental cell lymphoma? Or do you think we will still need some CAR T cell for some patients? Because CAR T cell, we also give it one time in some patients and after it's free on the B specific antibody, also have to come every week or every month to the hospital. So it's not also exactly the same things. Oh, you're absolutely right. And um, I, I totally agree with you. I think my specific antibody as a field is a bit uh, early for me to comment on whether it will completely replace, which I don't think will ever happen. I think CAR T cell therapy will remain um, and will be an important piece uh, uh, that we'll use for some patients. Uh, but if we are going to have a more population-wide impact on this disease, then yes, I would hope that bispecific antibodies do equally good or even better than CAR-T. Um, the biggest thing that I am looking for in bispecific antibodies is kind of that similar 30-month OS, you know, the, the risk-based um, assessment of the, of, the, of the drugs. And if bispecific antibodies are as agnostic to high-risk features as CAR-T cells are, then yes, I think that would be super exciting. Um, and I think it would replace many of the indications for CAR-T, although I would hope that CAR-T cells work in spite of uh, 
being refractory to bispecific. And in that way, you are adding another line of therapy for these patients and improving overall survival that much. Yeah, we, we still need to have to generate more data to know really how we can sequence this treatment because also we don't know if we'll be able to use CAR T cell after a patient receives this kind of B-specific antibodies because of T cell exhaustion and so on. Mm -hmm. So still very, very difficult to, to give a, a definitive answer, I understand. Uh, we have another question, or maybe we can give an answer for this one. He, somebody uh, in the chat has a question regarding the use of allogenic stem cell transplantation. It was used to be used uh, in patients for mental cell lymphoma uh, a few years ago, but now with all these new treatments, do you think we still need to discuss allogenic stem cell transplantation? Of definitely now we have the the, the CAR T cell, we have some clinical trial with B specific, so we ju we just have to forget about uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation. Um, I think using allogenic stem cell transplant is a practical challenge. Uh, in a, a very aggressive lymphomas like mantle cell lymphoma, partly because you saw the kinetics of this particular patient, right? When they relapse, it's quite rip roaring, and you know there is really hardly any time um, to to make the moves that we need to make for something as complicated as allogenic stem cell transplant. And that's just one part. The other part being that allogenic stem cell transplant uh, itself can be quite toxic, and the treatment related mortality is very high. So I think those, those two points put together, allogenic stem cell transplant will move back further and further, especially because of all these advances that, that we just talked about uh, are happening. So I would never say that allogenic stem cell transplant has no role. You know, occasionally we'll see these patients who end up having simmering disease at every relapse, but they have otherwise very great performance status. And even if they are, let's say they have relapsed after CAR-T, those patients, I would not rule out allogenic stem cell transplant, you know, and um, we could potentially cure them, um, but it, it requires a very, very detailed discussion uh, and so that the patients understand all the risks that come along with it. Yeah, we will always have some patient that will be refractory to uh, everything, to CAR T cell and to be specific antibody and that may need this, this allergenic cell cell transplantation. This is what we see for patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia when we see that will all these new treatments will no longer use allergenic stem cell transplantation. And now we start again to do some transplant in those patients because they are uh, in fa treatment failure from venetoclax, from ibrutinib and from everything. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we will see if we have a, a lot of new treatment, if we can forget, but today we still need the allogenic stem cell transplantation. Yeah, I completely agree. We have a few questions also regarding the use of uh, bandamistine, uh, bandamistine rituximab. Maybe I can ask you that, uh, to you, uh, Faiza, this question regarding the cardiac toxicity of uh, bandamistine rituximab. Uh, do you know if there is a tox cardiac toxicity of this treatment? You know, I don't think it's classically defined the way that our patient presented. Um, the, the way that she presented in florid heart failure with this tachyarrhythmia and new onset AFib, um, I'm sure there's a small percentage that may have this as a side effect, but from what we could see in our discussions with cardiac oncology, it's not a, it's not a, um, a typical side effect of bendamustine rituximab. We think of it more with cytarabine, but not with the bendamustine piece. Um, Dr. Kathari, if, I don't know if you know differently, but that was my understanding. Well, no, I, I totally agree with you. And it was very puzzling when we saw mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, she got bendamustine rituximab at uh, one of the uh, outside facilities, and I was the one kind of helping with designing the treatments. And I was a bit surprised to see that she had such flooded heart failure. And I think it potentially was because of underlying already, uh, you know, problems, and it was more ischemic than not. And I think um, clearly, um, personally, I've not seen any cardiac toxicity. And I wonder, Florent, if you have any opinion on that. But overall, I would not say that bendamustine is something that we, we typically think about having problems with the heart, you know. Yeah, I will have the same feeling. And in fact, in this patient will have do exactly the same thing and go with the bandamistine with no uh, no fear regarding the earth's functions. We have also another question regarding the, the toxicity, the cardiac toxicity. 
uh, on somebody uh, ask do you for the BTK inhibitors and for CAR T cells do you assess also uh, the uh, the earth functions and do you have a, a minimum uh, level from the earth functions to start BDK inhibitor or to uh, to use CAR T cells because we know it's easier sometimes to you to receive CAR T cell compared to autologous stem cell transplantations so what is your how did you choose your you select your patients I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? So whether, so, uh, how do I choose CAR T versus autologous? No, so in fact, the, the first question is, do you, uh, is there any uh, contraindication regarding the earth function to use BTK inhibitors on CAR T cells? This is the first question. And this lead me to another question. How do you use autologous versus CAR T cell in a, for example, for, for example, in this patient that have some earth dysfunctions, of course it will easier for me, and I think you think the same thing to use CAR T cell compared to autologous. Mm -hmm. um, I'm. I, I don't think that uh, has a large impact. On the contrary, right? Like we have seen data, although it's more experimental than not. Uh, ibrutinib is thought to be a very good partner to CAR T cells because you know you see this. Um, uh, perif peripheral lymphocytosis that happens because of all the lymphocyte egress that happens from the lymph nodes to the peripheral blood. And you can actually capitalize on that phenomena with uh, after CAR T cell infusion to see if you get synergy between the two drugs. And there are a lot of early phase clinical trials looking at that combination and they have found synergy. Um, but just to uh, be clear, our case here, she had high risk disease, complex carrier type. So autologous stem cell transplant was not something that I was too excited about doing anyways. I mean, if you look at the complex karyotype data, um, even they definitely live less than uh, the patients who have high, they don't have high-risk features. But not just that, but there was really no improvement with autologous stem cell transplant at all. So I would really avoid autologous stem cell transplant in high-risk uh, patients. And I have another question from the chat regarding the use of bendamustine on CAR T cell collection, because as we know, in the myeloma patients, there is some first report that showed that patients that received bendamustine within the nine months before uh, cytotheresis on CAR T cells have a lower oral survival probably because there is a lymphodepleting effect of bendamustine on lymphocyte, and we have some lymphocyte less effective. Here in the setting of the uh, mental cell lymphoma patient that will receive bendamustine, do we have an, any data regarding the impact of bendamustine? If we, if it will be a reason just to avoid bendamustine in the treatment, just to have a better CAR T cell mm -hmm. product, what is your feeling uh, about that, uh, Shalina? That's a great, great question. And I think uh, there are a couple of things that you could do to circumvent that problem, right? So one is that I totally agree that, I mean, we know that bendamustine can be quite lymphodepleting. And, you know, I typically quote five to 10% chance of that prolonged effect, that there is a tail of T-cell depletion, which can, of course, cause infections, but it can be a bigger problem for the T-cell collection. Um, the way, and that's why I like this regimen of BR alternating with high dose cytarabine, where it was studied in both ways. So where you could do three cycles of BR upfront and then do three cycles of R cytarabine later. So then you have, you know, you're further away from CAR T cell, from needing to collect T cells for CAR T. And that's what, that's what I've started preferring in the clinic. So I would do three cycles of BR upfront. Um, and then move to uh, our cytarabine regimen. So in that way, you know, in, during that time, even if there was going to be T-cell depletion from Benda, that would hopefully have uh, worn off by the time we need to collect T-cells. But that is, a, uh, that is something that we have seen in mental cell lymphoma commonly, especially in the past where, um, you know, we used to do like six to seven to up to eight cycles of uh, uh, our Benda, um, and it can be a problem. And I don't think there is any way around it other than to wait. And one of the things to do was, of course, to make sure that they have appropriate prophylactic antibiotics ongoing. But then maybe while you are waiting for some recovery of T cells, you can start bridging with, you know, uh, active drugs like ibrutinib or venetoclax and stuff and just wait until the T cells have uh, recovered. So yeah, thank you. So we are running out of time. Maybe we can take one. There is a lot of question in the chat. We'll not have time to take all of them. Maybe we can 
take this one because you show us some very good data that demonstrate that bandamustine rituximab is better compared to the classic air shop regimen. But specifically in patients with have an important marrow involvement, do you think that for these specific patients it will be better to use the anthracycline from the air shop compared to the air bandamustine? To be more cytolytic on the lymphoma cell on the on the bone marrow, or we just use bandamustine rituximab as the other patients. Yeah, I, I I'm not aware of any convincing data that if you have bone marrow involvement, anthracycline regimens are better. Um, um, especially in the modern era where we know that maintenance of rituximab is important. We know that. Um, that now we have, you know, CAR T cell therapies available in the relapse refractory setting. So overall, I I um, I, be I believe strongly that Arbenda is one of the most active regimens in mental cell lymphoma, which perfectly balances toxicity to efficacy, um, um, followed by maintenance of rituximab. The question of autologous stem cell transplant, and whether or not uh, we should consolidate or not, that remains to be answered. And there are a few clinical trials ongoing, one of them being with MRD analysis, uh, which is EA4151, where we are, uh, accrue to quite a bit here. Um, but, you know, to answer your question, I think Arbenda is probably a better regimen, regardless of those, uh, uh, you know, phenotypes, either bone marrow involvement or stage of the disease. I will just take one last interesting question from the chat. I will ask to you first, Faisal, and after to you, Shalin. If you can't use BTK inhibitors because sometimes it's happened, what other bridging option do we have? So I see we can use venetoclax, but do we have some other things we can use? So Faisal, what is your feeling first? You know, I haven't seen it done, but looking at the data, um, I don't see why we couldn't try a, a proteasome inhibitor or something like lenalidomide. Um, or venetoclax alone. Um, I'm not sure what the data behind it is, but um, those I think would be reasonable options to consider if you can't use a BTK inhibitor. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the only thing I would potentially avoid just because we don't have a lot of data is lenalidomide, you know, right mm -hmm. before CAR T cell therapy. Although, uh, um, you know, I don't think we have any data to suggest that it causes problems either. Um, but I think venetoclax is a reasonable uh, drug to use, but I would kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, argue a little bit here that there are only a few patients who are really not eligible for BTK inhibitors. And I think we really need to uh, figure out why this patient is ineligible to BTK, because now we have three options in mental cell lymphoma, ibrutinib, acal ibrutinib, and zanabrutinib. And uh, I think acal and zanabrutinib are very more specific than ibrutinib. And we know that patients who already have, let's say, for example, a history of atrial fibrillation, it's a relative contraindication. It's not an absolute contraindication because there is no data to suggest that adding a BTK inhibitor causes worsening of these uh, arrhythmias. Um, so, you know, if they already have it and if they are appropriately on anti, you know, uh, anticoagulants for it, um, I really don't see why we cannot use BTK inhibitors in those folks. And uh, there have been many times more in CLL than mantle cell, but just because we are, there are more CLL patients than mantle cell, there are so many times in clinic where we have somebody who has AFib, is on a blood thinner, and is also on a BTK inhibitor, and they do just fine. Um, so I think I would challenge the questioner just a little bit to see why the, this patient is ineligible for BTK. Yeah, you, you are really a good point here. So uh, I think it will be the, the, the road of the end. I want to thank you again for the really amazing case on these really great uh, discussions. And uh, we'll be uh, happy to uh, see uh, all of you for our next case presentations uh, very soon. So uh, have a good day or good evening and uh, see you soon.